everyone. My name is Melinda St. Louis and I'm the Director of Public Citizens Medicare for All Campaign. It is my honor to welcome you tonight to our exciting town hall, Building the Movement for Healthcare Justice. We, we will be led by Senator Bernie Sanders and Representative Pramila Jayapal tonight, and we are sponsored by Public Citizen and 35 partner organizations. Tonight, we've assembled some of the movement's most powerful voices from labor, faith, business, health providers, patients, and all levels of government to take stock of what COVID-19 pandemic has taught us about what was already broken in our healthcare system, the scourge of systemic racism, the cruelty of tying our healthcare to employment and corporate profiteering, and we'll focus on solutions tonight, like Medicare for All, that will help us achieve healthcare justice. Most importantly, we'll, we'll discuss how we build a movement from the ground up, starting in each of our communities to do just that. We have three all-star panels of experts led by Senator Bernie Sanders, Representative Pramila Jayapal, and Representative Ayanna Presley. If you're watching the live stream, we hope you'll sign up at healthjusticetownhall.org to learn more about how to get involved in our campaign. As thousands of us are assembling, for the next couple of minutes, we'll hear some of the healthcare struggles people are facing in this pandemic, and then we will begin our first panel with Senator Sanders. The absurdity and the dysfunctionality of the current healthcare system is becoming apparent to everybody. Millions of U.S. workers are losing their health insurance as a result of massive layoffs due to the coronavirus pandemic. 90% of our members suddenly lost their jobs. And with that came the fear of the loss of their health insurance. Obviously, that kind of system is not geared to handle the kind of mass influx of patients that are gonna come with COVID-19. I've been in critical care for 12 years. I'm no stranger to some of the pitfalls of our healthcare system in the United States. Uh, however, I just have never seen it in such um, dire circumstances. This pandemic, in my mind, is showing just how badly we need transformative change. I'm angry that we, as a society, created a healthcare system that didn't pri actually prioritize the health of our patients. The hospital industry is not about patient care, it's about profits. So now, nurses like me take the biggest risks. As immigrants, we work very hard. My family pays taxes. We do everything to help this country. And during the pandemic, we're just been left to the side. Por lo regular y por lo general, no calificamos para ciertos programas de salud y no hay que olvidar que todos los merecemos. El cuidado de la salud es un derecho humano. Policy experts say that the racial wealth gap in this country explains both why people of color are more likely to get sick and why they have more to fear from the shutdowns. The black community has been uh, disproportionately impacted by um, the, the confluence of three crises, the coronavirus, um, and then the only thing the coronavirus could not kill, racism, the pandemic and the scourge that is uh, uh, police brutality, and then an economic crisis and hardship born out of the, uh, the crisis of the pandemic. Uh, these are shocking numbers. This shows the lack of inequity. This exposes the structural deficits that we've all known about. But when you put an accelerant like a coronavirus in the midst, uh, African-American are desperately impacted. This pandemic challenges us to build a more collective society where we are truly our brother and sister people. Front and center is the struggle for health care as a human. We live in the richest country in history and yet we do not guarantee this most basic human right. Everyone living in America should get the health care they need, regardless of their employment status or ability to pay. And we need that access to health care today, tomorrow, and always. It is now my honor to welcome Senator Bernie Sanders from Vermont, who has been a stalwart champion for healthcare justice, the author of the Medicare for All bill in the Senate, to lead our first panel on the, what the pandemic has taught us about the dangers of our for-profit healthcare system. Welcome, Senator Sanders. 
Well, Melinda, thank you very much. And let me thank Public Citizen uh, for the extraordinary work they have done for so many years. You have been a great ally in so many struggles to benefit working families. And I very much appreciate all that you guys have done. It seems to me that when we talk about healthcare, we're talking about a couple of basic issues. First of all, we're talking about a very human issue. Brothers and sisters, simple question. Is healthcare a human right or is it a commodity to be made available to the people who have money? Simple question. Are we okay with a system that says that if you're very rich in America, you can really get excellent quality health care? You can afford any of the experimental prescription drugs that might be out there to help you with your cancer, your heart disease, Alzheimer's, whatever it may be. But if you're working class or if you're poor, sorry, you get to the end of the line. So the very first question that we have got to answer as a nation is, do we believe that health care is a human right? Or is it a privilege? Or is it simply something that is a job benefit? I go to work, and maybe the company I work for has a pretty good health care system. Maybe it has virtually nothing that I can afford. Maybe I'm in a union, and it's really, really very good. But... If it is a job benefit, what happens when I lose my job? And that is, of course, what we have seen over the last many months during this pandemic. We have seen tens of millions of people lose their jobs. And for many of them, when they lose their jobs, they lose their health care for themselves, for their spouses, for their kids as well. Please understand that of all of the countries in the world, the major industrialized countries, there is one country, yeah, you guessed it, the United States of America, that does not guarantee health care to all people as a human right. And I get a little bit angry with the corporate media because we don't talk about this very much. I live in Burlington, Vermont. I live 50 miles away from the Canadian border. And somehow, 50 miles away from me for decades, the people in Canada, a country not radically different than the United States of America, have been able to provide quality health care to every man, woman, and child in this country with zero out-of-pocket expenses. You're not going to hear this on CBS or NBC or even Fox TV. But in Canada, if you have a difficult medical procedure, you have heart surgery, you have cancer treatment, you could be in the hospital for three weeks, for four weeks, and you know what the bill is when you come out of that hospital? It is zero, not a nickel. And you say, how could that be possible? It's possible because their system like virtually every other major country, is publicly funded out of the tax base. Well, your next question is, well, how much does it cost? Well, in Canada is one example. It costs about half as much per capita as we spend. Brothers and sisters, we are spending $11,000 for every man, woman, and child in this country for health care. Some three and a half trillion dollars, 18% of our GDP. This is double per capita of what almost any other nation on earth is spending. Well, then you might say, well, if we are spending so much money, double what the Canadians are spending, surely, surely we have by far the best healthcare system in the world because, you know, we're paying through the nose. Must be a great system. Well, not really. For a start, despite spending twice as much per capita on health care as do the people of any other country, we have today over 90 million Americans who are uninsured or underinsured. Let me underline the word underinsured. What underinsured means is you may have some crappy insurance, but the 
premiums, the deductibles, the co-payments are so high that you cannot go to a doctor when you need to go to a doctor. 90 million people in the richest country on earth have no health insurance, or in many cases, they cannot afford to go to the doctor when they need. Now, here is the insanity, the irrationality of the current system. What happens when somebody has no insurance or is underinsured and they cannot go to the doctor? What happens when they're sick and they can't get treated? Well, duh, a couple of things happen. Number one, they get sicker. And then they may end up in a hospital at great expense to the entire system, or they may end up in an emergency room getting by far the most expensive primary health care available in America. But there is a second reality as to what happens, and that is in America, we lose some 60,000 people every year who should be alive, but they are dying because they don't get to a doctor when they should. Can you believe that? Richest country in the history of the world, and people are dying by the thousands every day because they can't get to a doctor when they should. Now, you might ask, how do we end up with a system that is not only far and away the most expensive, but the results of the system, the indicators of the system are not particularly good? If we are spending so much money, obviously our life expectancy must be higher than any other country on earth, right? We must be living longer, more productive lives. Ain't the case. We are way down on the list of life expectancy. Surely our infant mortality rate will be lower than other countries. Not the case. It is much, much higher than most other countries, especially for African-American and Latino mothers. So what we are stuck with is a system whose results are bad, but cost us twice as much per capita as any other country. Now, I want to give you the good news. The good news is that if you are the CEO of an insurance company, hey, congratulations, you are doing fantastic. If you're a CEO, you're making tens of millions of dollars in salary. You got great stock options, great retirement benefit. Insurance companies, healthcare industry, last year, I believe, made $100 billion in profit. And not just the health insurance. Then you get to the pharmaceutical industry because an important part of modern health care is prescription drugs. You want to hear something crazy? All over this country, patients are sick. They walk into the doctor's office. Doctors write out a prescription. One out of five of the people who get that prescription cannot afford to fill, cannot afford to get it filled, get the medicine they need because the price is much too high. So not only are we spending twice as much per capita on health care, but the cost of prescription drugs in this country is far, far, far higher than it is in any other country on earth. I remember during the campaign, I was in Detroit, Michigan, and I met with a number of folks uh, who are diabetic, who are dependent upon insulin to stay alive. And I want you to hear this, because this is really crazy. People need insulin. Millions of people in this country need insulin to stay alive. Well, we got on a bus in Detroit. We went to, I think, 15 miles into Canada. Took us a half hour. Do you know what the cost of insulin in Canada was compared to the United States? Same product manufactured by the same company. It was one tenth the price, ten percent of the price. And people there who were with me started crying. You know, they could not believe that they could buy so much of the insulin they needed at a cost that they could afford. So you might ask yourself. How does it happen that we spend so much for healthcare? We spend so much for prescription drugs. How come we're getting ripped off to such an enormous degree? And the answer is pretty simple. It has everything to do with a corrupt political system. The debate over healthcare, the debate over healthcare really is not about healthcare. Nobody can defend 
this dysfunctional, wasteful, and cruel healthcare system. It really cannot be defended. The real story is simply that the healthcare industry is enormously powerful that over the last 20 years, they have spent billions and billions of dollars on lobbying, on campaign contributions, so that the people they own in the United States Congress will refuse to do what every other major country on earth does, and that is provide health care to all people. Well, uh, as Melinda mentioned, uh, I am the proud author, author of the Senate bill on Medicare for All, and all that is about is saying we're going to expand Medicare to cover every man, woman, and child with no out-of-pocket expenses. We're going to expand Medicare to cover dental care, which is a major crisis in this country. We're going to cover hearing aids. We're going to cover eyeglasses. And we're going to cover home health care. Bottom line, health care is a human right. We can save money by moving toward a Medicare for all system. And I look forward to working with public citizens, as well as public citizen and many of your organizations to make that happen. All right, my speech is over. I went on for too long. Uh, let me now introduce a good friend, uh, somebody who is one of the great trade union leaders uh, in this country. Uh, she is the international president of the Association of Flight Attendants, CWA. And that is Sarah Nelson. Uh, and I want to start off the discussion with Sarah by asking her, how has the pandemic fully exposed the dangers of tying health care to employment? Sarah, thanks so much for being with us. Bernie, thank you so much. And health care is a human right. And public citizen and all my good friends who are on this call tonight, um, I thank everyone for coming together and talking about healthcare justice. Uh, we are, I, I am just going to admit, I'm feeling quite emotional tonight. I'm feeling quite emotional because half of my union right now is looking at losing their jobs October 1st. And because we have a system where healthcare is tied to employment and a for-profit system, these people are in double jeopardy because they're not just looking at losing their paycheck, they're looking at losing health care too. Across the aviation industry, we're 80% organized, so these are union jobs, every single one of them with a union-negotiated health care plan, relatively good health care plans that we negotiated long ago, and every time we go to the table, we have to choose between paying higher premiums or cutting some of the coverage, because the costs continue to go up in this for-profit system. So let me be very clear. It's very good that unions have been able to push forward on good health care and try to push forward on that and provide that for people. But in a for-profit, employer-based system, people get left in the cold and out in the dark. And right now, People who are facing the biggest stress of their life during this pandemic, essential workers who have been going to work, keeping our country connected and going and risking their lives, risking their families' lives as they're doing that, are now facing the double jeopardy of losing their jobs because of the pandemic and then also losing their health care. So we have a mother and father, for example, who are on the furlough list right now, looking at losing their health care on October 1st who are both flight attendants and parents of a special needs child who needs regular health care visits. They are thinking about moving stuff into their car and figuring out how to survive and figuring out how they're gonna take care of their kids. That's one story and a lot of stories. This is absurd. And we have incredible support all over Capitol Hill to continue the payroll support program to keep people in their jobs. We had to do that during this pandemic. When I go to Canada and talk with my friends and unions and I talk about the fact that one of the reasons it takes us so long to get union contracts to negotiate them is because three quarters of the time is spent talking about health care coverage. So people don't get raises either. And if they weren't paying for that health care, they would be getting those raises. And if we didn't have corporations who had to think about giving benefits to people, we could actually have 
a payroll protection program that Bernie and Pramila have championed during this time. In other countries, that works because you can replace those paychecks through a government program, but you don't have to count on those companies thinking about whether or not they want to pay for the benefits. We have a screwed up system here. It is mean spirited. It doesn't work. And we have to change it. And we're, I'm going to fight like hell for the people that I represent right now to try to keep them in their jobs so that they can keep their health care, but so that we can live to fight another day so that we can get health care for everyone. Because negotiating with people who don't care if you live or die, and that's where we are, is not an option. Health care is a human right. And I stand with all of you in solidarity, make sure that we have it for everyone. Sarah, thank you so much, not only for being here tonight and for your remarks, but the extraordinary work that you are doing. And I know that the trade union movement, along with all of us, we are going to come together to make sure that health care is the human right, not just the job benefit. So thanks so much. Our next guest uh, is a good friend of mine. Uh, his name is Dr. Abdul El Sayed. Uh, he is a physician. He is an epidemiologist, a former professor, and he just wrote a very, very good book uh, on this subject. Uh, he directed the Detroit Health Department from 2015 to 2017 and was a recent candidate and ran a great campaign for governor of Michigan in 2018. Uh, let me ask Dr. Sayed, as a public health expert, how could a Medicare for all system improve the U.S. response to the pandemic? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, uh, Senator, and thank you to Public Citizen for convening us today. And thank you to my good friend, uh, Sarah Nelson, for her fight and her work uh, advocating for working people across this country, in particular those uh, in our skies. Um, there are four big ways that um, having Medicare for all would have fundamentally changed America's experience of COVID-19. First, as we know, 5.4 million people lost their health care in the middle of a pandemic simply because they lost a job. And the fact that we ask uh, uh, in our country people to have to be employed to get something as basic uh, as health insurance is the problem. And so uh, it would have decoupled um, the uh, economic losses of losing a job from the health care losses uh, that, that people sustained uh, in the midst of the pandemic. So more people would have been covered. Everyone would have been covered uh, without having to worry about the consequences of losing a job. And of course, uh, in a pandemic, it's not just the pandemic disease that you worry about. It's all of the other things uh, that, that you have to worry about, even with respect to your health. And so uh, the importance of being able to go and see a doctor uh, in the midst of a crisis is critical. That's number one. Number two, we watched in the beginning of this pandemic as uh, our frontline healthcare workers went without the basic personal protective equipment that we needed. Uh, we did not have the, the, the kind of stockpiles of something as, as, as simple as a ventilator uh, to be able to provide uh, care for people who are getting sick. And that has everything to do with the fact that in our system, uh, healthcare is a business, not a human right. And as a business, uh, the consultants come in and tell the hospitals that they uh, need to be stocking their equipment just in time. Meaning you don't wanna have too much extra uh, because that would cover or hurt your bottom line. But that what that means is that when you're facing an influx of patients, you don't have anything extra, uh, which means that you're wearing garbage bags and, and reusing N95 masks. In fact, um, there was a corporation that bought the company that the U.S. government had, uh, had contracted with uh, to make excess ventilators. And that corporation decided it wasn't worth making them. And you know what the name of that corporation was? It was called Covidian. I mean, that's, you can't even make this up. Um, and, and the reality is, is that we didn't have the stockpiles that we needed. The third issue is that um, we were in a situation where hospitals on one side uh, were battling COVID-19, but they were also battling bankruptcy at the same time. Why? Because when you're facing a, uh, an infectious disease pandemic, you have to cancel all of the highest profit margin uh, elective procedures. And those are the way that the hospital makes money in a for-profit system. And so you had hospitals who were paradoxically uh, full with patients and also uh, facing bankruptcy at the same time. And then the last, the fourth, is that why is it in our society that we don't invest in prevention? Because in this society, you can only really make money if you're a healthcare corporation when people get sick. And so there is no incentive to really invest in public health and invest in prevention because both the health insurance industry 
and the hospital industry and the pharmaceutical industry all rely on people going through that uh, process of getting sick and then being healed uh, to exist in the first place. And so we spend less per capita on public health and prevention uh, than comparable countries. So those four issues, the fact that people lost health care uh, in the middle of a pandemic, the fact that we could not provide healthcare workers with basic PPE to care for us, the fact that we were watching hospitals go bankrupt, uh, and the fact that we don't invest in prevention, all of those are a function of our healthcare system. All of them would have been different uh, under Medicare for all. Abdul, thanks very much uh, for the great work you are doing. Uh, our next guest has kind of a unique history. Uh, Wendell Potter is a former health insurance executive uh, who had a crisis of confidence and in 2008 walked away from his job at Cigna, one of the country's largest health insurers. He is a brave and vocal critic of the health insurance industry and is a best-selling author. Uh, my question for Wendell is, in what ways has the private insurance industry and big pharma profited from the pandemic and, and fought common sense reform? Thirdly, thank you so much. And thank you, public citizen. Uh, the industry, the two industries that have done ex exceedingly well during this pandemic, especially, uh, are the insurance industry and the uh, pharmaceutical industry. While half of Sarah's membership is facing the loss of their jobs and millions of other Americans are losing, have already lost their jobs and their health insurance. Uh, and people are turning to GoFundMe and bankruptcy court. The big winner, quite frankly, has been the insurance industry. Uh, the companies that I work for and the other big for-profit insurance companies have made record profits. United Healthcare alone during the first six months of this year made $14 billion in profits, the most it has ever made in six months. Uh, and the other companies have, have done almost as well. And what have they done with that money? Uh, in many cases, rather than helping people get the prescriptions, they bought back their own shares. They spent billions of dollars doing nothing more than buying back their shares, which benefits their shareholders. Uh, they've been doing exceedingly well ever since, uh, you know, for many years, certainly since the Affordable Care Act was passed, which I support it. Uh, you could have bought shares of United uh, Health uh, Care, United Health Group's uh, stock for $28 in 2010 when the Affordable Care Act was passed. It would now cost you $292. That just shows you how much uh, Wall Street has profited uh, during these past 10 years. And in this pandemic, uh, they've done, as I said, extraordinarily well. Uh, the, the, the other thing you need to know is that these companies over the past several years have been erecting barriers systematically to make it difficult for people to get the care that they need. Uh, that is one way that they've been able to make so much money. They've been uh, increasing the requirement that doctors have to seek uh, approval or prior authorization uh, before they can treat their patients. They've been pushing more and more of us into high deductible plans, which is why, as you mentioned, Senator, that people even with insurance can't afford to pick up their prescription drugs. Uh, and they've been increasingly drug kicking doctors and hospitals out of their networks. During this pandemic, United Healthcare alone has been kicking a lot of hospital based physicians out of network. Uh, radiologists, emergency room physicians, and, and anesthesiologists in particular. So that's another reason why Americans are facing, even if they have insurance, surprise bills. This all started increasingly uh, kicking doctors uh, and hospitals out of their network. The other thing that you need to know is that during this pandemic, we heard the insurance companies uh, give us the assurance that people uh, would not be charged anything out of their own pockets for being tested for COVID or for being treated. That was absolutely an empty promise. Here's one thing you need to know. Most of these big insurance companies uh, can't uh, follow through on that promise because most of their uh, enrollees are in self-insured plans, in group plans. And if you read the fine print in their statements, you'll see that those assurances only apply to their so-called fully insured book of business. And the vast majority of their enrollees are in self-insured plans. Uh, more than more than twice as many of United's enrollees, for example, are in group plans, self-insured plans, and they have the option of opting out of that, that assurance. 
So you've seen that's these are just among the reasons why these companies or how they've been able to make so much money. Uh, I said when the Affordable Care Act was passed that we should have seen that as the end of the beginning of reform. Uh, President Obama, 10 years ago, said that we needed to pass a public option to keep these companies honest. Uh, I don't know that that would have done the trick, quite frankly, uh, I think. And that's why I have become uh, a very all. Uh, these companies will do whatever it takes. The one thing they, they, they will do uh, relentlessly, they're slavishly devoted to this, and that is to make sure that Wall Street is satisfied. As I said, when I testified before Congress the very first time, more than 10 years ago, I saw how these companies dump the sick uh, and confuse their customers all so they can satisfy their Wall Street investors. That is what is important to them, and that is why we need Medicare for all. Well, Wendell, thank you very much. And, and, and uh, let me thank all of our great panelists. I just want to reiterate, reiterate a point that Wendell just made. I want you all to think about it, the vulgarity and irrationality of this system. 90 million people have no health insurance. More and more people are losing their health insurance, and yet the profits for the insurance companies are going sky high. Now, if that makes sense to anybody, hey, give me a ring and explain that to me. It is a cruel system. And the other point that I want to make, which we did not touch upon, if you're a patient, if you're a doctor, the insurance companies drive you crazy by having to spend enormous amounts of time filling out forms. Think about a system where you don't have to fill out forms, where you go to the doctor when you're sick, take out a little card, and that's it. You don't have to spend half your life arguing with the insurance company. So, panelists, thank you very, very much. And uh, Melinda, I think I uh, pass it back to you. Thank you so much, Senator Sanders, and Heartfelt thanks to President Sarah Nelson, Dr. El Sayed, and Mr. Potter for sharing your wisdom and your passion with us. If what you heard made you angry, because it made me angry, I urge you to sign up to join our grassroots movement at healthjusticetownhall.org before the end of the night. Um, I'm now honored to introduce our next panel on working for healthcare justice in this pandemic. And it will be led by Representative Pramila Jayapal, who represents Washington's 7th District, and she's the co-chair of the Congressional Progressive Caucus and the lead author of the Medicare for All bill in the House. Uh, we'll have the opportunity to ask Senator Sanders and Representative Jayapal some questions after this panel. So please share your questions in the comment section of the live stream uh, platform that you're watching on. Uh, so I'll turn it over to you, Representative Jayapal. Melinda, thank you so much. Uh, thank you to you and to Public Citizen for hosting this incredibly important town hall. And uh, that last panel had some of my all-time favorite people, of course, our visionary champion, Bernie Sanders, um, also the co-chair with me of the Biden-Sanders Unity Health Task Force, Abdul El Saeed, and Sarah Nelson, thank you for fighting for workers and thank you for the emotion. It was so necessary and so right on for the crisis that we are seeing. We have another great panel coming up. And look, I just want to start by saying something uh, about the, the, you know, just where we are. We don't have a system. We talk about a healthcare system. Even I have talked about a healthcare system, but we don't have a healthcare system. We have a sickness system. We have a set of for-profit interests that essentially suck all the money out that there is at the expense of people's health. And that is what we are dealing with. And our bill, Bernie Sanders and my bill, um, the Medicare Crisis Act, is one way to deal with providing health care for people right now in the midst of this pandemic. Our bill together called the Paycheck Recovery Act that Sarah Nelson talked about would at least ensure that we don't kick people off of health care when they lose their jobs. This is a crisis of epic proportions. And how differently America would have reacted to the pandemic if we had already had Medicare for all. Every other industrialized country realized a long time ago that healthcare can't be tied to employment, that it needs to be guaranteed to everyone to have a thriving society. And, and as Bernie said, we had 90 million Americans who were uninsured or underinsured before COVID ever hit. And with the pandemic now, 12 million more 
have lost their health insurance. And let me be clear, that's lost their jobs and couldn't get other insurance. We have 27 million who lost their health care because they lost their jobs. Some of them have managed to get on other forms of health care. But imagine what that took. And no one is arguing with us anymore that employer-sponsored health insurance offers you so much choice because what choice do you have when you actually lose your job? 200,000 people. That is the number of lives lost today in America. And that is the equivalent of if we had had a 9-11 attack every day for 67 days. Now we've got patients who have survived COVID-19 who are getting $30,000 surprise medical bills, all while these for-profit insurance companies rake in record-breaking profits. Here's another thing to know. The death rate in Canada due to COVID-19 right across the border in my home state of Washington is zero, zero. And the first COVID-19 case in the United States was right here in Washington state seven months ago. And yet we still don't have national testing or contact tracing strategies or a coordinated public health response. That's failed leadership for sure, but it's also a failed system. And the chaos with testing and lack of PPE to our essential workers, millions of people losing health coverage and all the lives lost that we have seen so far are not the same scale of problem in countries with a single payer healthcare system like Canada, South Korea, Taiwan, and Australia. They have zero, like in Canada, to 22 COVID-19 cases per capita. The United States has 196 cases per capita. That's 10 times more cases per capita and 10 times the number of deaths. Now, let's just talk about healthcare justice. We can't talk about this pandemic or healthcare in this country without talking about institutionalized racism that shows itself in every way. Black Americans are nearly five times more likely to be hospitalized as white Americans. And they're twice as likely to die from COVID-19 because of our unjust system that denied them care in the first place and left them even more vulnerable to the virus. But then on top of that, add to that, that black, brown, indigenous workers, low wage workers, immigrant workers are more likely to be on the front lines picking the food that goes on our tables and in our food banks, uh, taking care of our elderly and our sick in nursing homes and in the health system, domestic workers. Let's just be really, really clear about the disproportionate burden that black, brown and indigenous folks in particular are bearing across this country. It, it's not that they just happen to be more affected by COVID-19. It's not because they're not taking care of themselves that they're dying at disproportionate rates. It's because of systemic racism in our healthcare system that has denied people the care that they need, forced them to live in toxic environments and put them at the bottom of the wage scale so they don't even have the basic protections that every essential worker should have, even as they're taking care of the rest of the country. So essential in name, but expendable. And so that's why when we talk about Medicare for all, we aren't just talking about universal health care. We're talking about the necessary steps that we need to take to achieve health justice in this country. And we're saying that every person, regardless of race or income or gender identity or employment status or immigration status, deserves to live with dignity. And that starts with guaranteeing everyone a real chance at a healthy life. Now today for this panel, I have with me three of our champions who have been at the forefront of that fight for racial justice and health justice in our country. Susan Rogers, Dr. Susan Rogers, Rana Epting, and Reverend Dr. William Barber, thank you all for joining us today. And I wanna start with you, Dr. Rogers. You are the president-elect of Physicians for a National Health Program, recently retired. You're also a volunteer attending hospitalist and internist at Cook County Hospital. In what ways would a Medicare for All system advance racial justice in healthcare? I think Dr. Rogers, you may be on mute. 
sorry. Well, you missed my thank you to you for the kind introduction, but I'm really honored to be part of this incredible panel. But as a practicing physician in a large safety net hospital in Chicago, I saw firsthand the unfairness and the fragmentation of our healthcare system. Healthcare inequities continue to be ignored by policies that endorse and support a private health insurance system that is tied to employment and purposely structured to not be available to everyone. COVID has further made bare these inequities that have long been ignored. People acted as if they didn't exist until COVID came around. Our current fragmented healthcare system is driven by profit, making poor people the patients no one wants to treat. Although research clearly shows that being poor and living in segregated neighborhoods is highly correlated with poor health, we still place facilities where they can make money, not where they can provide needed care. Hospital quality incentives, like the reporting of patient outcomes and pay for performance programs, that only exacerbate these inequities because these measures often penalize the institutions that treat underserved populations. Racially segregated housing is a key contributor to health inequities because it concentrates poverty and minimizes the support and facilities needed for good health. Hospitals have been closing in inner city neighborhoods and rural areas where new medical, while new medical centers have been built in affluent areas and suburbs. The closures of these sim smaller to mid-sized hospitals have left behind medical deserts. They have eliminated a much needed source of employment for many in those communities. So this leaves many low income neighborhoods without a safety net and it undermines efforts to recruit doctors to care for those who live there. With Medicare for All, this country could, would provide the resources where they are needed, not where they can make a profit. And the coupling of insurance to employment has disenfranchised poor people, minorities, and people of color since it began back during World War II. It leaves out the millions of essential workers in this country who do not receive health care benefits through their job, yet make too, li too little money to pay for health insurance themselves. The lack of Medicaid expansion by some states left many working age blacks and other minorities without any health care coverage. And for those employed who do have insurance, their out-of-pocket costs for deductibles, co-pays, non-covered services are a totally unnecessary financial barrier that limits their access to care. Medicare for All would eliminate this, this profit motive and provide access to needed care for everyone. Medicare for All would allow the delivery of health care to where it is needed, not to where it can make a profit. We need to change the financing of our current health care system to break this cycle of poverty and inequities. So we need Medicare for all now. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Brooks, for that. Uh, really appreciate it. And our next panelist is Rana Epting. She's a dear friend, the executive director of Move On, a member-led grassroots progressive organization. Rana, how do we keep building momentum for Medicare for all when... The corporations that profit from the healthcare system are literally trying to buy politicians, spread lies to try to scare the public, putting ads on TV and doing everything they can to terrify people and that somehow thinking that Medicare for all is going to hurt them. How do we deal with that? Yeah, thank you so much, Representative Jayapal. It's wonderful to see you. And I'm happy to be here with all of you talking about an issue that is dear to my heart, dear to the millions of Move On members all throughout this country. Um, and first, I'll say in response to your question, this is not a challenge we haven't been up against before. This is a tale as old as time. Corporate America, wealthy special interests up against the will of the people. But the good news is we have won this debate with the public the majority of Americans support Medicare for all. And that support has only grown during the pandemic and the related economic crisis. As people all across this country, we have seen people join together across races, culture, backgrounds, ages, class, join together to stand up for racial justice, 
to demand economic justice, and to stand up for the fate of our very democracy. So healthcare is one of the many issues where the public is way ahead of the politicians. The people, the people understand that healthcare is a right, not a privilege. The people understand that the health insurance companies care about profits, not patients. The people understand that you need coverage whether you have a job or whether you don't. And we know that even in good economic times, the rising cost of healthcare is unsustainable. Too many of us are one health crisis away from bankruptcy. Now, the people know this, but we need the politicians to listen. And we also know change never comes from Washington. Change comes to Washington. This is how rights, how um, uh, systems in our country have been created to benefit the people have always been because the people have demanded it. Senator Sanders, Congresswoman Jayapal are incredible champions. They are the heroes for our cause, but we know you can't do it alone. You need us. You need a massive movement. You need us, and we're going to show up. We must make visible the undeniable public support for Medicare for All. We see it in the polling. We hear it at the dinner table. But we have to show up and demand it from our elected officials. We cannot let the minority who oppose it drown us out with the help of the insurance industry. And we know it won't happen overnight. We know now more than ever, we need to be raising our, devo- our voices and demanding change. And Move On members are ready to go. It's been a long time coming, and it's time this country answers the call. We must be writing our representatives, calling our senators, We have to elect more champions at all levels of government, and we have to help our champions in Congress build more support from their colleagues. And I just want to say, at this 8.30 p.m. hour on the East Coast, it is possible. It may sometimes feel like it's not, but it is possible. They may have the insurance money, but we have the people. We have the majority, and people power in the end always wins. Not saying it'll be easy. I'm not saying the path will be straightforward, but that's never stopped us before. We have the makings of an incredibly powerful movement. We are seeing it with our own eyes out there today. It's rooted in caring for one another. It's rooted in fairness. It's rooted in compassion. It is a beautiful movement of people from all walks of life coming together, standing up for our country, standing up um, for one another, demanding that this country and our society take care of one another, this movement won't allow us to fail each other. It will stand up and we will prevail. And we'll do it with you, Representative Jai Paul, and with Senator Sanders and all of our friends on the Hill. And those that aren't with us, we will push. We will push. We will continue to push and make it so. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rana. And the power of the movement is real, right? Like you look at what we accomplished in the last two years in Congress with H.R. 1384 in the House, the Medicare for All bill in the House that I'm so proud to lead. We have over half of the Democratic caucus. We have conti- we got the first ever hearings in the House of Representatives on Medicare for All. We have cities and counties and states across the country passing resolutions for Medicare for All, including in red states. And so this is about a people's movement. And there is no one, no one that exemplifies the p- power of, of the people's movement, the moral movement, the moral voice than our next panelist, who is an inspiration to me every day, gives me comfort when I see what the movement that he is helping to build and lead is doing. And that is the Reverend Dr. William Barber, president and senior lecturer of Repairs of the Breach, co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. Dr. Barber, it is so good to have you. And I wanna ask you specifically to talk about how the for-profit healthcare system has just exacerbated the inequities in our healthcare system for people of color, for poor people, for low wealth people, and how we should think about that and how that should inform our work as we fight for healthcare justice. Well, certainly, thank you, my leader. Uh, you, every time you're on uh, MSNBC or anywhere telling the truth, I'm your amen call. You might not hear me, 
but I'm screaming at the TV. I, I, I say, preach, job, Paul, preach. That's what I say every time. <laughs> I'm recording that so that I can play it to myself. <laughs> yeah, I um, want to back into this a little bit differently, but we end up in the same space. Um, first of all, I want to just folk to hear something that the people of faith heard uh, when they were facing a narcissistic, mean ideologue idolatra in the in the on the throne in ancient Rome who had taken over the Senate, taken over the courts, and was seemingly ruling with impunity. And they got a word, uh, we are not of those who shrink back unto destruction, but we are those who persevere unto the salvation of the soul. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. And after that there was that came this long list of people who had fought things much worse than what they were fighting. And so the first message was, don't act like you're the first ones to fight. <laughs> and then don't act like this is the worst we've ever seen. And then finally, don't act like we can't we can't win, overcome it. And then I was thinking today about Thurgood Marshall. Uh, after a crazy, crazy Supreme Court situation, Dred Scott, 1857, a chief justice that have, should have never been there, uh, rules on the Dred Scott decision. And Frederick Douglass says, as monstrous as this decision is, remember that power or oppression like ours uh, will always seem invisible right up to the time it falls. Maybe this is the, the last link in the necessary chain of events toward the ultimate downfall of this oppression. And so remember <clears throat> that every attempt to blot out the, this movement has only served to embolden and intensify our agitation. I just want to say that to all of us out here. Uh, we're not in times greater than anything else people fall. In fact, people fought stuff worse than what we're facing. It's just our time to gird up, stop mourning in the corner, but mourn in the street and at the voting box because mourning the kind we need is the kind of mourning that the Greeks, and in Greek it means you care so much, you refuse to stop. And if you refuse to stop, you'll get comforted. Something will come along and assist you. I also, tonight, as we talk about race in light of all that has happened today with, um, you know, this crazy case in, in Louisville to make clear that racism is as much a white people's issue as a black people's issue. Because um, if COVID has exposed anything, it's something that public health persons like Sister Rogers understands, that pandemics <clears throat> live in the fissures created by systemic racism and systemic poverty. And certainly we know that Trump did not get bad after COVID, <laughs> bad before COVID in all the things we care about. I also wanna, wanna tonight uh, say, let's not commit what I call light, uh, 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 racism light <laughs> that often gets committed by liberals and, and progressives. And that is to conflate poverty and race um, in a way that really help, doesn't help us deal with either issues that you think poverty means black. Because too often what has happened is Republicans have racialized poverty. Democrats have tended to run from poverty. What we need to do is face poverty. And what do we mean by that? I mean, 60, uh, there were, before COVID, 140 million people poor and low wealth, 43% of this nation, over 50% now and going up. Now that 140 million is 61% of all black people are poor and low wealth. 30, 30, 31% of all white people are poor and low wealth. But that 30% poor and low wealth white is 66 million white people in raw number, which is 40 million more than the 26 million poor and low wealth black people. We have to have that conversation. And before COVID, I mean, we talk about death during COVID, but I'm convinced, um, um, Representative John Paul, that one of the things we must repent of is we weren't talking about death till during COVID. And, and we talk about death when we see it on the video camera when somebody's knee kills somebody. There's a lot of death going on before COVID. 700 people dying a day from poverty before COVID. A quarter million people were dying a year from poverty and low wealth before COVID. The, what, part of what we have to do is deal with necropolitics, the politics of death. And racism and classism and denying health care has always had in it what I call the DM on the DL, death measurement on the down low. And we cannot be a society that only gets moved by the policy death, what Dr. King called policy murder, is when somebody films it. 
because most of the deaths that are caused by policy murder, whether it be racism or class, will not be filmed. It will be put in statistics. And we must put a face on those statistics and lift them up. But we also must admit uh, we had 30 some presidential debates since 2016. And, and I won't even go back to 2012, 28. 43% of the country living in poverty, nearly 30, 40 million people uninsured even after Medicaid expansion. We have had one debate on poverty and low wealth in the primaries or in the general election. Part of this progressive and by progressive leaders and particularly those that run for president and run for higher offices have to and governorship. We have to turn that. We cannot keep letting these things not be a part of the political conversation. And so here we are. Here we are. We're in a moment in this country where, that we've seen before. Did you know the Freedom Bureau, talk about race, the Freedom Bureau Hospital, all of them were closed except one at Howard and one at and, and Raleigh by 1868 after the Civil War because of the former slave owners that did not want black people, former slaves, free blacks, and poor white people to get free health care. So this business of blocking health care has some deep roots, Right. Uh, we need to know that it was 1912, 108 years ago, that Theodore Roosevelt talked about health care being one of the seven moral political things that had to be. And he wasn't even looking at it through the lens of black people. He was looking at it through the lens of working people who were working in factories, who didn't have a living wage, who didn't have a minimum wage, who were dying uh, because they, they didn't have basic ventilation and so forth and so on. Eight, 1912, in the Bull speech that he, Bull Party speech he did, 108 years, I believe, that's the year, 1920, yeah, 108 years. Now, if we're serious about dealing with race and for-profit um, health care and how it affects the poor, one third of all poor people live in the South and one third of all poor white people live in the South. And the level of poverty in the South between blacks and whites is almost equal. I want you to stay with me on this. Every state, we, my sister talked about we've won the battle in terms of you know people being for us. But too often, my progressive politician friends haven't acted like it. And what I mean by that is we say we've won the battle in terms of in the polls. People say they're for health. But then we don't fight in the place where, where we need to talk about the most, and that's in the South. Even though we know in the South, every state right now in the South that's a high COVID state was, is also, was also before COVID a voter suppression state, a high poverty state, and a, vote, and a healthcare denying state. Think about that for a second. Every state, if you look at those from North Carolina all the way over to Texas, they blocked healthcare, high poverty, voter suppression. So one of the things that has to happen, and, and some of us said this to the Obama administration when they passed the Affordable Care Act, we were saying, come south. Stop just talking about it in the Midwest. Come south and let these people understand that they're fooling you. Go to North Carolina and show people that when North Carolina's Republican General Assembly blocks health care, expanding health care, they are going to hurt 346 white thousand white people. And 140 some and 130,000 black people and 30,000 veterans. Go south. Talk, go to Mississippi, go to Alabama. Why? Why? And show people that the people that are fooling you on race are also taking your life, causing you death. Some one stat says, correct me if I'm wrong, somebody, that for about 4,500 people die from every 1 million people that don't have health care. So we can't just talk about. 200,000 people have died from COVID. On top of that, if we think about just 40 million people without health care, that means 200,000 people have also died this year from the lack of health care on top of, plus the others that have died from poverty. It is important that we lift up this amount of necropolitics so that it will scare us to life. It is important that we put a face on all this death and show how people who engage in systemic racism and will make out that the, the voters, um, um, the Obamacare, I don't like that name because it's the Affordable Care Act, but they will, they will subtly say the Affordable Care Act means black people and brown people getting something free. We have to unpack that narrative. It is a powerful narrative of fear. 
and we have to go after and we can't just go after then Wisconsin, Michigan and all that. Great. I'm not talking against that, but you got to come south. Now, why? And I'm through. Why? Why? From Maryland to New Mexico, 30 states in the southwest. That's 193 electoral college votes. That's 60 senators. Because you can't change this. We could, this is it's closer than we realize. But you got to change the Senate. You got to change the presidents. You got to change some of these states. It doesn't, it doesn't even have to take another two years. But we got to fight differently. And we can do it right now. Do you all realize that Mike Epsi is within 0.5 percentage points in Mississippi beating an ardent opponent of, of expanding health care? And he's not getting any help? If we're serious about this, we're going to have to fight everywhere. Everywhere. Right. And this is the last reason. 193 electoral votes from Maryland to New Mexico. 193. Now, oftentimes we call those states red states. They are not red states. They are unorganized states. Because in those same states, in the majority of them, it only would take between 1 and 19 percent of poor and low wealth people who are already registered to vote to vote. In, from Michigan to Wisconsin to Pennsylvania last time, Trump won by about 90,000 votes. 2.1 million poor and low-wealth people that were eligible to vote didn't vote. Now, why don't they vote? We just did a study called Unleashing the Power of Poor and Reverend, Low-Wealth People. They we're, said, we're number one, I'm to... through. Number one, they don't hear their issues. Number two, transportation can't get off work. Number three, voter suppression. Here's the deal. We want to win. Come south. Let's break the south, and we can break the back of this regression when it comes to health care. And we'll do it black, white, brown together. And we'll sing hallelujah when we win. That is fabulous, Reverend. And thank you so much for that. And, you know, we're going to fight also on poverty as we've been fighting on the defense budget. We've been fighting on so many things to make sure that we are addressing that poverty and putting the money where it should be. That's so right. I want to thank all of our incredible panelists for your work. Um, the reality is we got a lot more work in front of us, but we are fighting hard. We are standing as warriors for justice. And uh, um, the rest of the country is with us. But as the Reverend says, we got to fight everywhere. So um, thank you all for, for being with us and for joining us. And I invite you all to help us build the movement. If you've been inspired by what you've heard tonight and you want to learn more about how to take action in your own community, please sign up at healthjusticetownhall.org. And now I think we're transitioning into a Q&A session. So Melinda, I'll turn it back to you to help, help us get through that. Thank you so much, uh, Representative Jayapal. And heartfelt thanks to Reverend Barber, to Ms. Epting and, and to Dr. Rogers for your wisdom and for, and, and for your passion. Um, before we move to our third panel, and I do want you to stay or stick around for that because Representative Presley is going to be leading our third panel. Um, we do want to get to a couple of your questions. We're running a little bit behind schedule, but there have been, there's been a lot of engagement, a lot of excitement around this town hall. And so for Senator Sanders and Representative Jayapal, we have a question from Vanessa Nelson Knox from Springfield, Illinois. It's, and her question is, how can we get more support for affordable insulin and preventative care for diabetics? We must prevent more disability from that disease. It's destroying the black community. Do you have an answer to that? Well, let me just jump in. And by the way, I want to say hello to Pramila and congratulate her for the extraordinary work she has done on Medicare for All in the House. It's been really wonderful. Uh, to Vanessa, I would say this. Uh, we have a pharmaceutical industry which is corrupt, which engages in price fixing and collusion, which is charging our people, as I mentioned earlier, 10 times more for the same insulin that is sold in Canada. Under a Medicare for all system, low income people would be able to get the insulin they need without any cost whatsoever. Nobody in the country would have to pay more than several hundred dollars a year for any of the prescription drugs they need. We need to have the courage to take on the pharmaceutical industry. We can do that in a number of ways. Having Medicare negotiate prices is number one. Having a strong 
uh, system uh, in which people can purchase uh, FDA-approved medicine from other countries like Canada is another approach. But maybe the easiest way is to do what the Canadians do and take a look at the prices being charged in other major countries around the earth and say, you know what? In America, we are not going to pay more than the Canadians or the Japanese uh, or the people in the UK. So there are a variety of approaches to making sure that we very substantially lower the cost of insulin and all prescription drugs in this country. Yeah, and I would just add to that and say that diabetes is is uh, life threatening, debilitating, loss of limbs, damaged nerve function, death, mm-hmm. and uh, you know we were able on your task force, Senator Sanders, the Biden Sanders ta- task force, we were able to get agreement to not only negotiate the price of prescription drugs for Medicare, but to do it across all payers and to use that system of the average prices of OECD countries so that we literally could say no no American will pay more than anyone in any other country. Now, just yesterday, I was talking to the Canadian Consul General for the Pacific Northwest, and he said to me, I'm a little worried that you all are talking about buying drugs from Canada because we have so little. And the strange thing is we buy them from the United States. And then you come over the border and you buy them back from us. And I said, right, this is a crazy system. I said, I promise you, that is not our end goal. Our end goal is to make sure we get the price of pharmaceuticals down in the United States. And hopefully that helps Canada as well. So he was quite reassured to hear that. But I said, but I said in the interim, (laughs) we still have to come across the border and buy our insulin. So let's at least make sure we can import in a good way. We promise we won't leave you behind Canada. So that's what we're fighting for. And that is, uh, it is just what we need to be able to do. Thank you. Um, The next question that we have is from Mike Miller from Knoxville, Tennessee. Um, He asks, how do we compete with the hundreds of millions of dollars that the healthcare special interests pour into our political and provider system? Can can I say a word about that? Well, let let Pramila jump in right now, I think. Pramila, did you want to? Yeah, sure. Well, look, um, we have to get money out of politics. You go outside one of our doors and Bernie knows this. There are 500 lobbyists for these insurance companies and pharmaceutical companies lined up outside the door to say, listen, you do this and I'll give you this money for campaign, for your campaign. Well, I don't take corporate PAC money. Bernie doesn't take corporate PAC money. We raise money from individual donors. And, but we've got to change the whole campaign finance system and bring some accountability into our system. In addition to that, we have got to make sure that People understand that these healthcare companies, these insurance companies and for-profit drug companies are not going to be any happier with a, quote, public option than they are with a Medicare for all system. They want to do everything they can to stop us from taking profit out of the healthcare system. They want to maintain their leverage. The only people that this system works for is those for-profit companies. And so Ultimately, the fight we have is a people-powered movement fight, right? We've got to get people across the country. We've got to elect more uh, Democrats, progressive Democrats to the House. We've got to take back the Senate. We've got to get uh, a different president in because no progress is possible on health care with Donald Trump in the White House. And that's ultimately uh, a key part of our, of our task ahead of us. May I say something I think to we that got, question? May I say a word to that question? We're going to make it very brief because we're running over. Well, three things, Brother Bernie. I think you're exactly right. And when when Democrats do get power, they need to have a 50-day strategy, not a 100-day. Some of this stuff, we got to do it when we have the power. Number two, don't forget that 19% in Mississippi, 8%. We're close. It, that's all we have to move. You connect people's lives to their vote, to their health care. It can change how they participate. And lastly, y'all can't say it, but I'll say it. After this election, we got to run the line down Democrats too, even black them, don't make any difference, that's taking money from pharmaceutical companies and not pushing this all the way. After this, you talk about a reckoning and a reconstruction. We got serious work to do because folk are dying. And that's how we got to frame it. We're not just talking about health care. We're talking about death. Okay. 
Yeah. Linda, we have one more question, I think. Sure. Yeah, we will. We have time for one more. Uh, we'll try to sneak it in from Dr. Richard Bruno from Baltimore, Maryland. Um, he's a physician in a safety net clinic, and he says he's seeing the toll that isolation is taking on people every day. Uh, he wants to know how we can promote the comprehensiveness of Medicare for all so that people know that mental health is also covered without copays and in or out of network barriers. Well, it's absolutely right. Uh, Dr. Bruno is absolutely right. When Pramila and I and everybody on this program talk about health care, we're talking about comprehensive health care. Guess what? Mental health is a health care issue. You break your leg, you got cancer. Those are health care issues. Mental health is a health care issue. It is absolutely disgraceful. And by the way, especially now, because of this pandemic, there is an enormous amount of mental health struggling going on in this country. Terrible statistics about young people uh, considering suicide, etc. So very simply, when we, when Pramila and I and everybody else on this program talks about comprehensive health care, we're talking about dental care, we're talking about mental health care, we are talking about all aspects of health care. That's the simple answer. That's right. And Bernie, I would just add to that, that right now, only 55% of mental health providers even accept insurance. And so our healthcare system isn't prioritizing mental health and emotional well-being. So even for someone who wants to seek mental health care, often they can't find someone in their network. They end up paying out of pocket costs or they end up just skipping care altogether. And so we've got to make sure that the examples we use aren't only about going to the ER or receiving cancer treatments. You know, we talk about that a lot in Medicare for All, but that we describe kind of the struggles that so many people have, as you said, during COVID-19 in particular in accessing mental health services. So we always highlight that our Medicare for All bills uh, cover comprehensive mental health care, substance use treatment, other services, and with no copays, premiums, deductibles, or out-of-network doctors. Thank you so much to both of you um, and for your leadership. We, uh, we are here, we're going to build the ground game to support you and we want to thank you so much, both Senator Sanders and Representative Jayapal. Um, we wish we could get some more questions because there are so many. We'll try to get some of those to your staff so that we can um, follow up uh, with so many people who want to engage with this. Um, but I'm now thrilled to turn our panel, final panel uh, to our final panel led by Representative Ayanna Presley, that's going to focus on the how, how we build a movement at the grassroots, community by community that will be strong enough to overcome the millions spent by corporations that are profiting from the status quo. Over the past year and a half, our broad coalition has built an infrastructure and grassroots toolkit to support activists in cities and towns, large and small, to win local resolutions from their city and county councils in support of Medicare for All. We've passed resolutions in blue, red, and purple states. We've built enduring co local coalitions and enlisting local government officials in our fight for healthcare justice. If you haven't already, please sign up to learn more about how to get started in your community at Health Justice Town Hall. Hall.org. Um, Representative Ayanna Presley represents uh, Massachusetts 7th District, and she's a powerful first-time Congresswoman who has unapologetically brought her organizers' savvy and progressive values to Washington to fight for healthcare justice and so many other important causes. We're proud to have you lead our Take Action panel, Representative Presley. I will turn it over to you after we hear briefly from some of the local leaders and activists around the country who have been building this movement in their communities. America cannot be great without Medicare for All. During this pandemic, it is critical for every single person to have the health care that they need. What the COVID-19 pandemic laid bare is a harsh and painful reality that Philadelphia's poor and working class communities have long known. Our health care system is broken. We have frontline heroes, essential workers who are too poor to afford medical care. In the middle of a pandemic, why everybody can't have health care is a large question to me. And one that shouldn't even have to be asked. 
one that you couldn't ask in any other industrialized country. Earlier this year, in May 2020, I brought a resolution before our city council in support of Medicare for All. That resolution passed, seven votes in support, two against, and I was ecstatic. In 2018, I was incredibly proud to partner with our Philadelphia DSA chapter and pass a Medicare for All resolution that denounced the depravity of an unjust and unequal healthcare system and affirmed again that healthcare is a human right. And we need to get away from the for-profit system. We need a system that's going to support uh, the American public. So in New Jersey, we passed three resolutions. We passed two at the municipal level and one at the county level. I wanted to pass a Medicare for All resolution in the city of Durham because it's just so important to me that we make sure that our residents have what they need to thrive. And healthcare is, it's a basic need. It's not a privilege. It won't happen unless we are pushing forward at the grassroots level. We don't have to wait for Congress. This needs to be a national movement. We need universal health care. We should have had it yesterday. The proper treatment of health care as a human right actually makes us all safer. Everybody out there, go out and organize for a municipal, local Medicare for All resolution. And fight until Medicare for All becomes the law of the land. All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. And um, we've got an exciting panel planned and I want to get to that uh, quickly. Um, I have some opening remarks uh, just to kind of warm us up a little bit, but um, they will be very brief in the interest of time. Um, you know, I represent the Massachusetts 7th Congressional District and I ran to represent uh, this seat because it is a diverse, dynamic and vibrant district and one of the most unequal in our country. And that's across every issue, um, but including and especially when it comes to uh, health outcomes. In a three mile radius, Cambridge, home to MIT and Harvard, to Roxbury, the blackest part of my district, life expectancy drops by 30 years and median household income by $50,000. The infant mortality rate for black babies in Boston is nearly five times higher than the rate for white babies with infants born in Dorchester and Mattapan having a lower birth weight than any other areas in the city. Now these inequities and disparities, these racial injustices, these healthcare injustices are not naturally occurring. They are legislated. These are policy choices. And one should not have to be wealthy in order to be healthy. The United States is supposed to have the best health care in the world, but these undisputed facts demonstrate it is not available to everyone. At the most foundational level, the well being of each individual shapes the well being of our economy and our future. And that's why this movement for health care justice, the movement for Medicare for All, is so critically important. And that's why we must fight until we win. In Congress, I'm a proud co-sponsor of Medicare for All legislation. Additionally, I've successfully advocated to create, fund, and to protect our community health centers and our school-based health centers across our country. I'd be remiss if I did not acknowledge uh, the incredible uh, leadership and stewardship and, and pace setting and movement leading of Senator Sanders and of Representative Jayapal. But ultimately, this is not only about fighting in the halls of Congress. As a former city councilor and an activist since I was a toddler on my mother's hip at tenants' rights meetings, I know that movements are powered by people at the grassroots level. You know, Congress will take the credit, but at the end of the day, progress is made, not for the conviction of lawmakers, but for the courage of everyday people who have repeatedly laid their bodies on the line. That has been true throughout history, and it is true today. So this panel, we will discuss how everyone can help build this movement at the grassroots level. And I am joined by some incredible uh, siblings of mine, chosen family, in our uh, chosen social justice and activist family. So I wanna begin uh, just by giving some quick bio introductions. So Robert Weissman is president of Public Citizen and a staunch public interest advocate and activist, as well as an expert on corporate and government accountability, 
prescription drug pricing, and access to the courts. Councilmember Philippe Cunningham represents the fourth ward in North Minneapolis and is a policy wonk. I love that because policy is my love language and a fierce community advocate dedicated to breaking intergenerational cycles of poverty and violence and building com community wealth. He's a board member of Local Progress, yay, and led a successful resolution supporting Medicare for All in the Minneapolis City Council. He is also the first and currently only out trans man of color elected to office in the entire United States. And of course, our fearless leader, my brother, Adi Barkin, was the founding director of two major projects at the Center for Popular Democracy, Local Progress, and the Fed Up Campaign. And when Adi was diagnosed with ALS, he co-founded Be a Hero to confront members of Congress about healthcare using the power of their human story. Yes, when you marry storytelling and that narrative with movement building, that is truly how we usher in systemic transformative change. So let's get right into it. I'm gonna start with you, Rob. A public citizen has led a coalition effort to win local resolutions in support of Medicare for all. So how does this fit into the overall strategy to get us closer to securing the policy changes we are seeking? Because I think so many people think the only levers to be pulled are at the federal level. And uh, given my eight year tenure on the Boston City Council, I know better, but could you share with our audience how this plays into the larger strategy? You're on mute. We're good? Yes. Sorry, friends. Um, thank you, Representative Presley, for all your leadership and, 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 uh, and inspiration. And I hope everybody watching has been as inspired as I've been through this town hall. Be before I get to the answer to the question, the most important thing to do from this town hall is to sign up and get connected because we don't make a difference on our own and we will win when we join together. So please go to healthjusticetownhall.org and sign up to become part of this movement. You're connected to it one way or another already by being part of this town hall discussion, but you've got to get engaged. And if you're not already, please sign up, healthjusticetownhall.org. So Bernie set the, fra set the frame for us at the beginning. We're not going to win or lose Medicare for all on the merits. The problem we face is the one that uh, Mike Miller posed in that question. It's the political power of the health insurance companies. It's the overwhelming power of the drug companies. And it's the unfortunate influence of the for-profit and even nonprofit hospital sector. So how are we gonna win that? Yeah, we have to win public financing of elections. We've got to overturn Citizens United. That's a whole important project, but we also have to build a movement to win. Cause I'll tell you, even if we win public financing, we're not gonna win Medicare for all unless we have a powerful movement to do it. How do we get there? Well, we gotta do a lot of things, but one thing we do is follow the instructions as we always must from Reverend Barber to make the stories personal. And we can't do that when we just talk about big numbers, as important as they are. We need actual stories and we need to tell those stories in our communities in, in contexts where we can have actual conversations. So the theory behind the resolutions movement is we can pursue those conversations and win important marker victories by asking localities and eventually states to pass resolutions supporting Medicare for all. When we do that, we give people an opportunity to come together, not just to, to do the thing to call your member of Congress, but to be in person with your city council member and your mayor. We give an opportunity to create conversations locally. We make champions of great local leaders like we're gonna hear from momentarily. And then we turn them into allies in the fight going forward who have better access to the members of Congress than we do just as constituents in the first place. So we're seeing this movement really take off. We have Cambridge, as you know, and as we're happy to have as one of the early uh, cities to support a resolution. And we have Philadelphia and Los Angeles and San Francisco and uh, Representative Jayapal of Seattle. But we also have South Bend, Indiana and Knoxville and New Orleans. And they're seeing momentum gain around this idea of local uh, activists winning, pressuring their local officials turning them into champions for Medicare for all, and then leveraging that up, up to Congress. So it's a crucial part of this movement building strategy. Um, and we think it's already showing 
that it can make a difference. And as we get bigger and bigger and keep getting more and more people engaged, we're going to get there and actually ensure that everyone in this country has health care as a matter of right, without regard to their wealth. Let me just say a final thing. You know, I'm listening to you, Rep- Representative Presley, talking about Cambridge. Those statistics are almost exactly the same in Washington, D.C., where I live and the capital of the nation. It is such a disgrace that we permit that to go on. So we have a big picture need to address systemic racism, to rebalance all these fundamental inequality. But man, it sure starts with healthcare. The charge is on us to win this and make this a better country, make it so that no one is denied the life chances that Reverend Barber is talking about because they don't have the money, because they don't have a job that gives them healthcare. That's what we're gonna do. That's right. And, um, you know, you use the word uh, disgrace there, Rob, and uh, I, I find that uh, that word is coming up for me often in my verbiage of late, um, in particular because, you know, the movement, it, the Medicare for All movement, which is um, certainly much more than a slogan, um, is one that is inclusive and intersectional. And so um, as I transition to my, my sibling uh, in Minnesota here, impossible for me to not just take a moment just to hold space for our collective pain and trauma and disappointment about the um, unjust and un- just um, disgraceful ruling by the grand jury today. Um, and so I just uh, want to bring, bring Brianna Taylor into the room and just um, underscore how um, the work that we're doing is really intersectional. And so uh, Council Member Cunningham is someone who has championed uh, Medicare for all resolutions in your city, um, you know, transitioning and just building upon what Rob was just saying. Can you share what led you to do that and what role you think local officials should play uh, in this movement? And I should just uh, say it's good to see you again. And, and again, I was bringing up um, uh, Kentucky because we were together in Minnesota uh, when I was last there uh, in the midst of um, our, our organizing and our grief around George Floyd. So. Yes, it's wonderful to see you again. And thank you everybody for having me be a part of this conversation with all of these amazing powerhouses. Um, you know, I first want to give my love to Adi because um, I'm a proud member um, and board member of Local Progress. And actually the reason why I decided to take up this uh, resolution in Minneapolis was because I it was a suggestion from Local Progress. It was a campaign they were organizing. And I said, oh, Easy peasy, like let's do this because you know, for for me as um, a city council member um, and representative, I'm sure you can really uh, relate to this. We are very close to our constituents um, as uh, um, as city council members, local elected officials. I represent 32,000 people, um, and I see them every day. I see them in the grocery store. I see them out when I'm walking my dog, like you know, I see them every single day. And so I decided to champion this resolution here in Minneapolis um, because I represent a community that experiences, much like we've talked about here, some of the highest rates of unemployment and the worst rate rate of health disparities in the city. And actually my community in North Minneapolis, we actually have some of the worst racial disparities across almost every indicator of quality of life actually in the country. And Minneapolis is often looked at as, well, before people got to really see how Minneapolis is after the the murder of George Floyd, but people really looked at Minneapolis as like this miracle city where people can go and be prosperous. But if you are a black Minneapolitan, the numbers are just so clear that that was not your story as well. So seeing these stark racial disparities in unemployment and when people's access, when their access to health care is connected to that employment, it is so obvious that Medicare for all um, is a racial equity issue. Um, and as we are in a time of grappling with systemic racism and structural violence in our country, we must anchor ourselves in the reality that healthcare for all moves us towards achieving racial racial justice. Um, Although some of the local jurisdictions, uh, many of us don't actually have direct authority over our um, healthcare systems, our local healthcare systems, 
Um, it is very important for cities and counties to take this resolution on through their legislative process because it puts it on your legislative agenda um, as a city. And so that means that those resources that you're putting um, as a city into state and federal um, advocacy, uh, that puts it on the list. And that helps to add that power uh, to counter the private interests. When you have more public jurisdictions coming together, um, representing millions of people across the country, that is quite a powerful movement. Um, so I'm, I'm very uh, grateful. Uh, to me, it just felt so common sense. Bring this forward. It speaks directly to the challenges that we're facing. Um, we as a city of Minneapolis, the city council, we committed to racial equity being, achieving racial equity and eliminating racial disparities in our city as our top priority. This fits right in line with that. So, um, so please, if you are a local elected official, take this up and, and be the champion for your city and county. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, you know, very, very well um, articulated and um, just reminds people of the various um, tools and leverage, you know, that really are available to us to strengthen our hand and to grow this movement. Um, and so, and this is, since you uh, are a proud board member of Local Progress, uh, the very first time that I met Adi was at a Local Progress uh, convention in, uh, in Austin, Texas. It was a defining moment. Um, I won't even say for me uh, simply as a local elected official, um, but really just as, uh, as a person, as someone who seeks to be um, a thoughtful uh, policymaker and a change agent and a disruptor. You know, I sort of felt like um, you guys, I think Local Progress was my original squad. That's where I found my people, okay? <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and that was where I, where I first met uh, Adi. And he continues to be a source, uh, not only of strength, but also of strategy. Um, just a brilliant, brilliant strategist. And I've always asserted that the people closest to the pain should be the closest to the power driving and informing the policy making and out of you embody that uh, uh, perfectly. So thank you for being on the front lines of health of the healthcare justice movement in more ways than one. We know that we have the facts and the moral arguments on our side, but transforming our broken healthcare system, you know, ultimately, I mean, this is a, a, a space full of truth tellers. This comes down to political will. You know, we have the data, we have the stats, we have um, benevolence and uh, the moral arguments on our side. But this is ultimately about political will and about building power. And that is something that we do um, not just in election cycles, right? This is the work movement building is the work of building power um, in election cycles, of building community, of, of, of power mapping and building all the time. So, Adi, what have you learned about building power and what advice do you have for activists around the country wanting to achieve healthcare justice? Hello, friends in the struggle. Thank you, Public Citizen, for organizing this event, and thank you, Representative Presley and Council Member Cunningham, for your work and leadership. Today, the terrible news out of Louisville adds to what has been a terrible week and a terrible year. So I know that we are all here with broken hearts, exhausted and infuriated. What you have heard tonight describes a health care system that is broken and a democracy on the edge of collapse. I know you are here because, like me, you want to do all you can to make Medicare for all a reality. My name is Audi Barkin. For those of you I don't know, over the past four years, I have gone from being a healthy man to being almost completely paralyzed, thanks to the onset of a mysterious neurological illness called ALS. That's why I am speaking to you with a synthetic voice through my computer using special eye gaze technology. We are freshly processing and mourning the death of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And I applaud all of you who have quickly sprung into motion to fight for a just court. Donald Trump has promised to get rid of the ACA. We should fully expect that a new justice will rule with the other conservatives to throw millions of Americans off of their health insurance. At the same time, we are in the middle of a pandemic where tens of millions of Americans have lost their jobs and their health care and tens of millions more are trying to do their jobs as safely as possible. 
the organizing work we must do together to elect healthcare champions has never been more critical. I admit to feeling depressed and heavy about where we go from here. But I'm here tonight to tell you that there is still hope. We can still work and organize together to make progress, struggle for justice and win big. The cure for our despair is to build power by taking action. I know that it is not easy. In the months and the years since my diagnosis, I struggle every day to direct my mind to productive places. But I have seen the personal benefits of success. I am happier and more at peace when I succeed. The truth is that there is tremendous healing power in hope. But hope is not a state of mind. It is a state of action. And taking action ourselves and organizing others to take action is how we build sufficient power to win. No matter where you you can get involved in the fight to win Medicare for all and begin to build a better democracy and a more just society. We must find and build a base of people doing the work to win in every city and state. I like the idea of passing supportive resolutions in your cities and states as a way to build the base of support. There are two immediate things that you can do to help save our democracy and protect health care. First, no matter if you can make a couple hours of calls during the week or volunteer for a shift on the weekend, we all must find time to call and text voters in key states. We cannot leave any stone unturned or voter uncontacted. If you are not already plugged into a get out the vote operation, please visit the Center for Popular Democracy Action website organizevotewin.org. Once again, that is organizevotewin.org. You can sign up for phone banking shifts pretty much any day of the week and into many of the states that we care about. Second, you can make calls to encourage Democratic senators to hold the line on blocking Trump's nominee to the Supreme Court. Demand Progress has a toll-free number of 202899938 that will directly connect you with your senator. Thank you for all you are doing and all you will do. Never give up. Keep on keeping on. Wow, thank you. Uh, Beautifully, you know, you just beautifully and powerfully spoke to the moment and um, the heaviness that we all feel. But I'll just say that I feel a little bit lighter uh, in this moment, uh, having heard from you. You always do that. Um, So thank you for illuminating the path forward and being specific about um, how we advance the movement from here and what everyone can do, because every single person has a role to play in the movement. And I do just want to, um, as we close, offer an affirmation that I have found uh, really helpful, and I hope that it will uh, embolden everyone um, as we sojourn on in this fight for healthcare justice and to make a Medicare for all law of the land, uh, in particular against the backdrop of this national reckoning on racial justice. And this is a racial justice issue. And so if you indeed do believe that black lives matter, um, the only receipts that matter are budget change and policy change. But I'm gonna share an affirmation with you from uh, my uh, scholar and dear sister friend, Uh, Brittany Packnett, and I won't read all of it, but uh, two of the stanzas that have resonated with me the most are, you know, I will choose the discipline of hope over the ease of cynicism. I choose fortitude over, over fatalism. I will choose the discipline of hope over the ease of cynicism, and I choose fortitude over fatalism. And what is that fortitude? It's courage in the face of great pain and adversity. So we find ourselves experiencing unprecedented challenge and an uncertain landscape. And so these unprecedented times do demand and require of all of us unprecedented organizing, unprecedented mobilizing, unprecedented legislating, and unprecedented Take a page out of Adi's book, Hope. So thank you all for sharing your expertise and your experiences. Um, and, uh, and I'll see you on the front lines. Amen, sister. Thank you. Thank you. Wow.
Wow. Thank you, Congresswoman Presley. Thank you, Adi. I'm gonna thank um, Congresswoman Jayapal and Senator Sanders and all of our distinguished panelists. This is like an overwhelming evening, an overwhelming evening of, of, um, of wisdom, of strength, of power, and I am so grateful. And I know that the dozens of organizations that co-sponsored and streamed this event tonight, we also thank you and I thank you uh, to all of our partners and mostly to the thousands of those of you who tuned in tonight from all over the country. What's crystal clear is that this unprecedented pandemic has only intensified the state of crisis that tens of millions of Americans have been living for decades under our for-profit healthcare system. And what we heard tonight is that the stakes are just too high now to decide there's nothing we can do or to try to tweak the broken system around the edges. We know our movement for change has, has a lot of momentum, but we will only win against the entrenched interests that put their profits over our health if we vastly increase our people power. So please, please do not go to bed tonight before signing up at healthjusticetownhall.org to be a part of this growing movement, town by town, county by county. Whether you're a seasoned activist or whether you've never engaged in advocacy before, we need you, we need you now. Again, sign up to learn more how you can take action in your community at healthjusticetownhall.org. We've come to the end of our evening, um, but really this is just the beginning and we know that. Um, on behalf of Public Citizen and the many co-sponsoring organizations tonight, I want to thank each of you for being a part of this movement for healthcare justice and Medicare for all. So please stay safe. We look forward to the day when we can gather in person finally and celebrate our collective victory when we win healthcare as a human right for everyone in this country. So. That's right. Thank you all and good night. Good night.